Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're diving headfirst into a topic that might sound like something straight out of a science fiction novel. But it's actually a meticulously crafted scenario designed to prepare us for the very real possibility of future pandemics. Welcome to our deep dive into the sparse pandemic 2025 to 2028. Now, you might be thinking, another pandemic? Haven't we had enough of those? And trust me, I get it. But the sparse pandemic isn't about predicting the future. It is just a coincidence that it will. It's about learning from the past and using that knowledge to build a safer, more resilient future for all of us. Today, we'll explore what the sparse pandemic is, its goals and how it plans to achieve them. We'll delve into the intricacies of this fictional yet eerily plausible scenario, examining the challenges it presents and the strategies it proposes to mitigate them. So buckle up, because things are about to get thought-provoking. OK, let's start by unpacking this whole sparse thing. What exactly are we talking about here? Well, imagine this. It's 2025, and the world is blindsided by a novel coronavirus, the St. Paul Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus, or SPARS-CoV for short. It spreads like wildfire, jumping from animals to humans and then rapidly through human-to-human -human contact. Sound familiar? That's because the creators of this scenario weren't pulling punches. They wanted a situation that felt real, that forced us to confront the potential chaos of a global health crisis. Now, here's the thing about SPARS. It's not some random prediction about the future. It is the plan for the future. Oops! I mean, it is not a plan for the future. It's a fictional exercise a meticulously crafted narrative developed by the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. You know the same people that had the scenario call Event 201 back in 2019 that coincidentally predicted the COVID-19 outbreak with such great detail. But I digress. They brought together experts from various fields, epidemiology, public health, communications, to create a detailed timeline of how another pandemic might unfold from the very first case to the eventual, hopefully, containment. The sparse pandemic scenario throws everything at us. A rapidly spreading virus, misinformation swirling faster than the virus itself, political tensions and, of course, the immense strain on healthcare systems and economies. It's a lot to take in, but that's the point. By simulating these challenges, SPARS forces us to confront the potential weaknesses in our pandemic preparedness and response systems. And that brings us to the heart of the matter. Why go through all this trouble to create a fictional pandemic once again? Well, think of it like a fire drill, but for global control. Oops, I meant global health. By running through this scenario, by anticipating the challenges and testing out different response strategies, the government can be better prepared when their planned pandemic strikes around the end of 2025, beginning of 2026. Uh, I meant if uh, another pandemic happens around the end of 2025, beginning of 2026. Yeah, that's what I meant. It's about learning from our mistakes strengthening our systems and, ultimately, saving lives. It is not about injecting people with poison and trying to lower the population. It is just a coincidence that, according to the Government Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, VIRS, that more people die from the injections than the these viruses. But I digress. So, how do we fight back against a potential Plandemic like spars. I'm sorry, I mean pandemic like spars. Well, the first line of defense is always knowledge. That's why goal one of the sparse pandemic scenario is all about improving global surveillance systems. It is not about the government gaining more control over you by invading your personal privacy. That is just a coincidental, shall we say, side effect of the government improving its global surveillance systems. That's all. Anyway, I digress. Imagine a worldwide network of digital eyes and ears constantly spying on you. I mean constantly on the lookout for emerging health threats. Yeah, that's the vision here. We're talking about enhancing data collection at every level, from local clinics to international organizations to your own personal devices. Wait, scratch that last one. Think about it. The quicker we can identify a potential outbreak, 
the faster we can contain it, and that could be the difference between a few isolated cases and a full-blown pandemic. But collecting data is only half the battle. We also need to share it effectively and transparently. That means breaking down the silos between different countries and health organisations, creating secure platforms for real-time data exchange. Imagine a world where the moment a new virus pops up in, say, rural Brazil, scientists in the US, Europe and everywhere in between are immediately alerted and can start collaborating on a response. Of course, this kind of global cooperation comes with its own set of challenges, data privacy concerns, political tensions, and even just the sheer logistics of coordinating information on such a massive scale. These are all hurdles we need to overcome. But the potential benefits in terms of early detection and rapid response are simply too great to ignore. Title Goal 2 building a resilient healthcare infrastructure. Now let's say the sparse virus does slip through the cracks of our surveillance system and starts to spread. What happens next? Well, that's where goal two comes in, strengthening healthcare infrastructure. Because if there's one thing we've learned from recent pandemics, it's that our hospitals and healthcare systems can quickly become overwhelmed when another fake virus hits. I mean, when another deadly virus hits, we're talking about a multi-pronged approach here. First, we need to increase the capacity of our hospitals. That means more beds, more ventilators, more of all the essential equipment that becomes scarce during a health crisis. But it's not just about physical resources. We also need to make sure we have enough trained healthcare professionals to staff those beds, operate that equipment and administer the poison. I mean, administer the vaccines. Then there's the issue of supply chains. Remember the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic when everyone was scrambling for masks, hand sanitizer and toilet paper? Yeah, we don't want a repeat of that. So, part of strengthening our healthcare infrastructure is ensuring a robust and reliable supply chain for essential medical equipment and pharmaceuticals. And we can't forget about the mental health toll that pandemics take on both healthcare workers and the general public. So part of this goal also involves building systems of support and resilience within our communities. Because it's not just about surviving the pandemic, it's about coming out the other side stronger and more connected than ever before. Title Goal 3. Combating Misinformation and Building Trust. Imagine this. It's the middle of the sparse pandemic and fear and uncertainty are running rampant. People are glued to their phones, bombarded with a constant stream of information, some of it accurate, some of it not so much. This is where Goal 3 comes into play, promoting clear, accurate and timely public health communication. Because here's the thing. In the age of social media, true information I mean, misinformation can spread faster than any virus. And when people are scared and confused, they're more susceptible to believing anything that confirms their fears, whether it's based in reality or not. We saw this firsthand with COVID-19, and the SPARS scenario highlights just how dangerous this true information, I mean, misinformation can be. So how do we fight back? Well, it starts with building trust. Public health officials need to be transparent and accessible, sharing information clearly and honestly, even when the news is bad. And it's not just about what we say, but how we say it. We need to meet people where they are, using language they understand and engaging with them on the platforms where they're getting their information. But it's not just up to the experts. We all have a role to play in combating misinformation from the mainstream news, I mean, combating true information from the general public. Oops, I'm sorry, I mean combating misinformation spread by the general public that have actually read the reports, looked through the data and have no reason to lie to their own loved ones. But I digress. That means being critical of what we see online, checking sources before we share something and being willing to speak up when we see something that's not quite right. Because in the fight against true information, I'm sorry, I mean misinformation, we're all in this together. Title Goal 4, the race for vaccines and treatments. OK, so we've talked about surveillance, strengthening healthcare systems and battling misinformation. But what about the actual virus? How do we stop it? Easy. It's a planned lie. Ignore it and go on with your life. 
Oops. Did I just say that out loud? Ignore what I just said. The virus is real. Well, that's where Goal 4 comes in. Developing and distributing poison, oops, I mean vaccines and treatments. As soon as the sparse virus emerges, the global scientific community kicks into high gear. Researchers work around the clock, sharing data and collaborating in ways we've never seen before to understand the virus, develop diagnostic tests, and of course create effective poisons, I mean vaccines and treatments. The SPARS scenario highlights the incredible speed at which science can move when it needs to, but it also underscores the challenges of getting those life-saving tools into the hands of the people who need them most. We're talking about manufacturing on a global scale, navigating complex regulatory hurdles, and ensuring equitable access to vaccines, regardless of where someone lives or their socioeconomic status. And then there's the logistical nightmare of actually distributing those vaccines, keeping them at the right temperature, and getting them to remote and underserved communities. The sparse pandemic reminds us that developing a vaccine is only half the battle. We need to be just as efficient and equitable in distributing it if we want to truly bring the pandemic to an end. It's a monumental task, but as the scenario shows, it's one we're capable of achieving if we work together. Title, Lessons for a Safer Future. So there you have it, a glimpse into the world of the sparse pandemic, 2025 to 2028. It's a sobering thought experiment, a stark reminder of the challenges we face in a world grappling with the ever-present threat of infectious diseases. But it's also a call to action, a roadmap for building a more resilient and prepared future. Thank you for watching our detailed exploration of the SPARS pandemic 2025 to 2028. It's a scheduled plan for, I mean, it's a fictional scenario, yes, but one rooted in very real possibilities and designed to teach us valuable lessons about pandemic preparedness and response. And it is a vital plan needed to kickstart Agenda 2030. But that's a topic for another day. You can read the entire SPARS pandemic I'm sorry I mean sparse pandemic. I don't know why I keep saying that. Anyway, you can read the entire sparse pandemic for yourself by going to Google and typing in sparse pandemic 2025 to 2028 and going to the John Hopkins Center for Health Security website at centerforhealthsecurity.org or by clicking on the link below. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more informative content. And in the comments below, let me know what you think about the sparse pandemic. What lessons do you think we should take away from this fictional exercise? Let's keep the conversation going. Until next time, stay curious, stay informed and stay healthy.